Brother Robert, why would you be emphasizing evangelism? And uh, the reason why that is, is because the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel as is often preached, or the message maybe that even you've heard, but the gospel as it was once and for all handed down to the saints, okay? The gospel that the apostles preached, the gospel that you hear in, and read about in the book of Acts, okay? Uh, that gospel is the only hope for humanity, okay? It's not in philosophy. It's not in government. It's not in anything that people are reaching for and trying to see uh, help society today. Um, our only hope is the gospel. That is the message of reconciliation to God through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. Uh, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. Or as perhaps the Jews would say, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And um, he is the only way. And getting back to the message of the gospel getting back to the message as it was preached in the book of Acts, as we read about in the Bible, is paramount today. Um, one of the things that is kind of a big thing that's going on right now is that you're starting to see dissent, dissenting voices, or people uh, being shut off from Facebook and Twitter, and their accounts being closed out. And I suspect this is going to continue. Uh, it's only going to get worse as time goes on, because um, the enemy is, is working to try to shut down anything that is going to remotely incline people towards God, or towards right, or towards anything that should be uh, considered good and wholesome. Um, the thief does not come except for to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and we need to understand that. So. I believe in the years to come, we're going to have to just continue to find different ways to get the message out, to get the gospel out. I look for here in America laws to be passed in this very next year to where it's going to be against the law to say anything about any kind of sexual sin, uh, anything like that. So there's all kinds of things that's going to happen that's going to bring challenges to us. But, uh, but these things haven't taken God by surprise, and he has got a generation and a people that he is raising up that is going to meet this generation right where he finds them. So that's something we need to recognize. But I want to share with you tonight on the topic of a history of evangelism. And we're just going to continue on uh, with that. And tonight specifically, I want to talk about, for the next several minutes, um, what I'm calling, or what has been called, the conversion narrative. Now, this is probably something that you've never heard before. Uh, maybe you've heard me say it, or maybe you've seen it possibly if you've read some really old writings in regards to evangelism or, or something like that. But the phrase conversion narrative, or the term conversion narrative, simply means a person's articulation of how they got saved, okay? Uh, in the days when the Puritans and the Pilgrims came over to America up in the Northeast, when this, of course, was just um, basically, un it was inhabited by, of course, the uh, Native American Indians or the Native Indians that were here. But as far as people coming from the West is concerned, uh, they arrived up in the Northeast and they wanted to establish a city on a hill, if it, as it were, sort of like a, a church or a place that was almost as close to heaven as you could get on earth. And in many of these churches, they required for church membership the people to be able to give a convincing conversion narrative, which basically meant they had to be able to articulate, again, how they got saved, how God drew them to uh, himself and how they repented of their sins and how they were truly changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you see, in those days, it wasn't as simple as it was in the days of Billy Sunday, where you just, quote, walk the sawdust trail, shake hands, whether the left hand or the right hand, because he would shake hands with two people at once often, um, and you're saved, or you're in, or you sign a card, and then you just want to kind of start out and then just do your best. This isn't how it worked. 
people genuinely were expected to recognize that they were sinful, that they were sinners, and that they truly came to a place to where they had repented, turned from their sin, renounced their sin. They knew that God had forgiven them of their sins and that they were changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, this was a watershed event in their life. It wasn't like they joined the 4-H club or they joined a club, or, you know, some other club. This was where people were transformed on a spiritual level. They passed from death to life, from the power of Satan to the power of God, or in theological terms, they were regenerated by the Holy Spirit, okay? The former things passed away, all became new. If any man be in Christ or woman be in Christ, they are a new creature. And that's what we're talking about. Being able to give a convincing conversion narrative. Well, I said a prayer or, or I went forward or I signed a card or I joined the church. This, this would never have, have sufficed uh, when this nation was being founded okay, in the, in the early 1600s up into the 1700s, there was an expectation that people had a genuine experience with God. So I just want to talk a little bit about that tonight. And then I want to share about a 25-minute uh, video uh, along this same line. So I'm just going to step back here because I skipped over. Mark chapter 8, verse 34 through 38 when he, that is Jesus, had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whosoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So you see then, there was an expectation already here in Mark chapter 8, and you see this in the other Gospels, that you were abandoning your former life, okay? And that you were also preparing, if necessary, to lose your physical life, okay? To give your life for the cause of Christ. See, it was a very serious thing to serve, thing, uh, serve Jesus in those days. You didn't just you know, join a church and start the church and say, oh, I'm a Christian or something, put a bumper sticker on or any of these other things. When you claimed to be a Christian, it was serious business because you would automatically, especially among the Jews, you would set yourself apart. You were following the sect of the Nazarenes and they were considered heretical and all these other things. And then you come into uh, uh, issues with the Roman government and other things like that. So for the first several hundred years, you could very easily lose your life for the cause of Christ, okay, for the first several hundred years of the church. And it's true in many nations of the world still today. For what will it profit a man or a woman if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Of course, this is a reference back to the Psalms, okay? And um, we don't have time to get into it tonight, but nevertheless, the question is very straightforward, okay? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. See, the more adulterous and the more sinful that the world becomes, the more they're going to heap shame, okay, on people who claim to be a, a Christian or to truly serve Christ, or they're going to do everything they can to try to modify what it means to be Christian, a Christian. They want to modify Christianity so that it doesn't even resemble the Christianity, uh, okay, of the New Testament. But whosoever will be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. So you think about it, okay, we can endure the shame now of serving Christ. Uh, one of the bad things about Facebook is people are afraid to say what they truly believe or people use it the opposite way to be as combative and, and abusive as they possibly can regarding what they believe. But the truth of the matter is this. Social media has a way of causing people to cower back and be ashamed of Christ. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, my feelings aren't hurt at all if Facebook goes the way of MySpace. Um, God has all kinds of other resources. There'll be other ways to get the message of the gospel out. 
but we are not to be ashamed of the Lord. And the more sinful and the more adulterous that the generation becomes, the more tendency there will be for people to be ashamed. But Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me before them, I will be ashamed of you, okay, in the presence of the Father and his holy angels. So that is a lot to think about, okay, and it's something that you don't hear a lot in today when the gospel is being preached. Luke chapter 3, verse 4, again, talking about John the Baptist, as it's written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now, one of the things that I want to bring out in this particular uh, session tonight, and, and I couldn't possibly, if I had 10 megaphones in my hands right now, I could not possibly shout loud enough and strong enough how important it is for the messenger of the gospel to be prepared. See, we have the message of the gospel. The message has always been what it is. We've had a copy of the book of Acts since it was originally penned and inspired of the Holy Spirit. We've had the gospels. We've had the entire word of God, okay, up until this very day. But the question is, how is that message going to be handled? And that is all dependent upon the messenger, okay? G.W. North, one of my favorite quotes of him, and I actually use this in Televangelicalism, chapter one, this is the first thing that I say to start the book. It's not preparation of the message, because the message is already prepared. It's preparation of the messenger, okay? The messenger has to, first of all, have their heart right with God. They have to be in agreement with God, okay? When Jesus called the 12, for example, he said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. And slowly, over the course of the next three and a half years, he taught them, he instructed them, he manifested himself to them, he revealed his power to them, he revealed his authority to them, and he preached the word to them, okay? In all kinds of times when he preached, they would have to make a decision whether or not they were going to continue to follow him or they were going to turn away. At one point, he made a statement some, along this line, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Well, many people quit following him. Well, we wouldn't know for quite a while longer what he even meant by that. So they had to take in faith what he was saying. He wasn't talking about literal flesh or literal blood. What he was talking about is you have to enter into the new covenant with me. You'll remember at the table at, at right before he was crucified he handed him the cup he said this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for for the remission of sin so on and so forth but nevertheless this blood of the covenant represented by the fruit of the vine was what he was talking about his word his spirit okay his words which are spirit are going forth and are like bread to us of course there's the literal also taking of communion and I recognize that but here's the bottom line the bottom line is is simply this there were times when Jesus said things that were difficult and they had to decide am I going to keep following Christ or not and over this period of preparation okay they were being prepared to receive the Holy Spirit now they're all going to have a really bad fall before this happens okay and when they come crashing down and they denied him Okay, Peter swore with an out loud oath and denied him. We just quoted the passage, if you deny me. Okay, so he already knew he had sinned something terribly and probably wondered if he could be forgiven because he knew what the Lord had said. But what, had, what happened? The Lord restored him. You read the story. Of course, they were out fishing. Jesus is on the bank. He's cooking some fish and they jump in the water. They swim to shore. They have a conversation. Jesus restores Peter and he recognizes then that he's been forgiven. So now he's put back on track, and then of course, it wouldn't be long after that, and then they would be in the upper room, they would receive the Holy Spirit, okay? Not by logical deduction and proof texts, they truly received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came into them, and they became living stones, as it were, in the temple. So God is dwelling in them. 
Jesus had said, he will be with you. That is the Holy Spirit. He was with you, but he shall be in you. And that's where the transition take, took place. Holy Spirit came into them. They were radically changed. They were a revival looking for a place to happen. They went out, they preached the gospel with power and authority, not in fear. I mean, they, they had a boldness that you wouldn't believe. Then they prayed for even more boldness. So this is what has to happen. If you put the gospel into the hands of a person who isn't capable, okay, um, I used this illustration just, just recently. I said, if you have a sword, okay, it may be the greatest sword that's ever been created, and you may put it in a museum, okay, and it may never do anything, and it may last for 2,000 years. But what happens when you put that sword into the hands of a warrior who is capable of wielding that sword? He could slay a thousand men with that sword. You may put it into the hand of an incompetent person and they couldn't do anything with it. They'd get it stolen, taken away, and who knows what all could happen, okay? So the message is like the sword, but the messenger is the person wielding it. Now the question is this, what are they going to do with the message? What are they going to do? Are they going to alter the emphasis of the message? Are they going to preach it the way it was intended to be pre preached? Are they going to be faithful to declare exactly what God said to declare? Because that's the difficult thing, isn't it? Because we know that when we share the truth of the gospel, it's going to anger people. Uh, it's not exactly how you win friends and influence people, okay? At least not at first, because there has to be this awakening okay, of a person. They have to become awakened uh, from their slumber. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But Luke chapter 1 verse 80, and I want to move on. So the child that is John the Baptist, here he's an example. He grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. You see, God was preparing John the Baptist to bring this message of repentance, okay, what did he do? He lived a life very similar to Elijah, okay? He was a Nazarite, almost like a priest, and he was living alone with God, and God was dealing with him, keeping him away from the trappings of this world, keeping him sanctified to himself, okay? Keeping the sin out of his life so that he could walk in boldness. What does the Proverbs tell us? The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Nothing will take your boldness any quicker than compromise and sin. You will not wield the sword of the word of God if you are living in compromise and sin. Another thing that Mr. North used to preach, and I don't mean to keep quoting him, but he said people preach their experiences. Preachers preach their experiences. If they live in victory over sin, they preach victory over sin. If they struggle with sin, they will preach that men struggle with sin. And I have found this to be absolutely true. And this is why the messenger has to be prepared, okay? In some cases, re-prepared, taken back, as it were, into the wilderness to get alone with God, get rid of all the things out of your life that are of a compromising nature so that you can take hold of the word of God once again and wield it as it is sharper than any two-edged sword. The message of the gospel has always been the same. It's recorded on the pages of God's holy word. The difference is the messenger. What does a particular messenger do with the message? See, that's the question tonight. Do they preach what is written or do they modify it? What are they going to do in the years to come? Because we know we're going to come under more and more persecution. Okay. Do they emphasize what the apostles emphasized in the book of Acts? Or are they, are they ashamed to, like we talked about a little bit earlier when we quoted Jesus? Do they add to or do they take away from? Are they empowered by the Holy Spirit to preach? Are they living holy before God? That's probably the biggest question. Are they using the message or the ministry to build their own brand or their own name? One of the things that totally just discourages me every time I see it is when you see ministers or ministries trying to look like rock stars or, or they're just trying to promote their brand or look a certain way. Listen, the key to power is humility. It's not volume. It's humility. And when we humble ourselves before the Lord, the Lord will truly use us to do exploits. We're not going to do that if we're trying to do like the Pharisees. See, you don't have to be wearing a tallit with zit zit 
real long to, to be a Pharisee. Anytime that you're doing things to try to exalt yourself in the name of God, you're behaving like a Pharisee. And God is not going to bless that. And there is a lot that is going on today that God just simply is not blessing and he's not going to bless. And if we haven't learned that, we need to learn it really quickly. Are they doing it, that is the ministry, for popularity or for financial prosperity? Why are they doing it? What is the motivation, okay? You know, people don't want to see your muscles while you're, while you're ministering, okay? I'm just going to be straight with you. And I see all this kind of foolishness all the time. And it needs to stop. God uses men and women who he has prepared to preach the message as it should be preached. That's what he's done. Listen, the pattern is found with the apostles. Each of them had to face the truth, the truth of the gospel for themselves and respond to it. Then they received the Holy Spirit and were transformed by the power and the grace of God. And I just want to say four things and then we're going to shift over to our um, short video tonight. Ministers, and I just want to say this because most people don't know this, ministers from the time of the Puritans until the early 20th century, I'm talking about until the time of Billy Sunday, viewed the hearers of the gospel in one of four conditions. So when they were preaching, they were preaching with authority, they were preaching the gospel in such a way that people would say, man, that's a hellfire and brimstone preacher. No, listen, that's just the way the gospel was preached. Okay, that's why we have a gospel today that's ineffectual. It's like the guy up in Liberty who was watering down the chemo drugs. You know, everybody's like, wow, I didn't even get sick when I took that. Well, that's because it was so watered down. Well, then they died. And the same thing has happened with the gospel. It has been watered down to the point to where it's not even effectual anymore. The people don't mind. You know, they can take the medication as it were, and they're not even sick, but they're not healed. And, the, and God chastened the Old Testament prophets when he said, You have healed the wound of the daughter of my people only slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. See, they didn't preach in such a way to get the people truly back right with God, only kind of partially back, okay? And it was sort of like we would say watering things down. But there are four conditions that they deemed people to be in. They were either careless about their soul, okay, which means they need to be awakened. That means you have to preach the gospel, and this is the most difficult part. You have to preach things that, that where angels would fear to tread. That doesn't mean you get out there and be mean and act crazy and, and try, try, to, try to anger people. That's not it, but you have to share the gospel in the part that causes people to recognize that they are a sinner. And this is the part that Paul said when he preached it, the Jews tried to kill him. As a matter of fact, they did kill John the Baptist. You'll remember Herodias took and uh, had Mo uh, John the Baptist's head brought to her in a charger. Okay, why? Because he told them, you're living in sin. It's not lawful for you to be married to this man, okay, or to this woman, all right? So they need to be awakened because they're careless. Once they're awakened, they need to be brought to a place of Holy Spirit conviction. What can awaken a person? It could be preaching. It could be a life-altering event. It could be a loss of a job. It could be somebody died. It could be that they got sick, got a bad report from the doctor. You could die. So this awakens them to think about their need for God. And then the third state people would find themselves in is convicted. This means that God is dealing with them. He is bringing them under conviction so that they recognize their need for him. And it's at this point where they make a decision. Am I going to resist the Holy Spirit or am I going to yield to the Holy Spirit? If you yield to the Holy Spirit, you will be converted. If you resist the Holy Spirit, you'll be just like the rich young ruler who went away from the Lord sorrowful. And that's the, the basics of it. And that's how ministers up into the early part of the 20th century in the days of Billy Sunday recognized uh, that uh, people were in and how they needed to address them as they ministered. I won't go into Thomas Hooker here because I talk about him uh, in, this, in this video. So I want to try to go over to it. If we have trouble going to it, I will just go ahead and share it in the comments. So if I end up closing out right here, then um, then 
then I will just go ahead and put it in the comments. But let me just give it us a few minutes and see what we can do with it. In 1662, the English Parliament passed what came to be known as the Act of Conformity. In this, all ministers who existed within the Church of England were supposed to follow the dictates of the Book of Common Prayer. As a consequence of this, there were hundreds, actually thousands, who refused to follow that prescription. As a consequence of that, over 2,000 ministers were pushed out, if you will, of the Church of England and became known as nonconformists. While the New England Puritans and Pilgrims were dealing with their issues in the colonies, Christians back in England were dealing with their own set of problems along a parallel line. In an event that J.C. Ryle has termed as an injury to the true cause of religion in England that shall probably never be repaired, the great ejection took place. As many as 2,500 ministers, including the likes of Richard Baxter, Thomas Brooks, Thomas Manton, and Thomas Watson, were ejected from the Church of England for refusing to follow the common book of prayer. Most of these ministers became known as nonconformists. We owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to several nonconformist ministers who influenced Christianity all the way down to the 21st century. I wish to examine three such men first being Matthew Henry, second John Bunyan, and third Isaac Watts. A few weeks after his nonconformist father Philip Henry had been ejected from his ministry within the Church of England, Matthew Henry was born prematurely. As a result of his premature birth, he was physically weak throughout his childhood. Nevertheless, what he lacked in physical health, he made up for in spiritual vitality. It is said that he could read portions of scripture at three years of age. Near his eleventh year, he was listening to his father preach, and in his words, he was melted by the sermon. This would mark his conversion experience. Educated in the nonconformist institutions, he became one of the greatest Bible expositors of all times. In fact, men such as George Whitfield, Charles Wesley, and John Wesley were influenced by Matthew Henry's commentary. In Charles Spurgeon's Commenting on Commentaries, he says these words, Every minister ought to read Matthew Henry entirely and carefully through at least once. I should recommend you get through it in the next 12 months after you leave college. Begin at the beginning and resolve that you will traverse the goodly land from Dan to Beersheba. You will acquire a vast store of sermons if you read with your notebook close at hand, and as for thoughts, they will swarm around you like a twittering swallow around an old gable towards the close of autumn." Unquote. Matthew Henry's commentary remains as a standard in multitudes of Bible students' libraries. In 1714, he accidentally fell from his horse, but managed to preach a sermon in this house. Afterwards, he traveled a few blocks away to this home where he died of his injuries. Charles Wesley wrote one of his most famous songs based upon a comment from Matthew Henry from the book of Leviticus. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save, 
and fit it for the sky. When non-conforming ministers left their churches, some members of their old congregations would gather in places such as hillsides or open areas to hear their old pastors preach. These meetings were called conventicles, a word meaning a small, unofficial religious meeting of lay people. In 1592, the English Parliament passed a conventicle act that forbade religious conventicles of five or more people other than family members that were outside the auspices of the Church of England. For violations of the Conventicle Act, John Bunyan was sent to county prison on a number of occasions that spanned 12 years. It was during these imprisonments that he wrote the book Pilgrim's Progress. Bunyan's book is one of the most important and widely published books in the English language. It has never been out of print and has undergone hundreds of editions. In fact, it has been translated into over 200 languages and made into plays and full-length movies. In 1688, on his way to London, Bunyan made a detour to Reading, Berkshire, to try to resolve a quarrel between a father and son. Continuing to London, to the house of his friend grocer John Strudwick of Snow Hill in the city of London, he was caught in a storm and fell ill with a fever. He died in Strudwick's house on the morning of the 31st of August, 1688, and was buried in the tomb belonging to Strudwick in Bunhill Fields. Isaac Watts was raised a nonconformist by his father who had been jailed twice for his nonconformity. From a young age he showed tremendous ability in the area of poetic rhyme. It is said that when being disciplined he once proclaimed, O oh, Father, Father, pity take, and I will no more verses make. Isaac Watts received a classical education, learning Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Notably, Watts broke with John Calvin's tradition of making songs from the Psalms and began writing original songs of Christian experience. This opened a new era of Protestant hymnody as other poets and songwriters followed in his path. Therefore, he has been called the father of modern hymnody. His songs will become instrumental to evangelism over the next two centuries. These include over 700 songs, including Joy to the World and When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Isaac Watts died in 1748 and is also buried in Bunhill Fields.
Along with Matthew Henry, John Bunyan, and Isaac Watts, there's another important figure from the 1600s that we have to discuss. His name was Thomas Hooker. Thomas Hooker was a Puritan who lived in England, but later traveled to the Netherlands. And from the Netherlands, he traveled to what is today Massachusetts. But finding disagreement with John Cotton, he traveled to what is now Connecticut and became one of the foremost preachers of what we have come to know today as preparationism. Understand that the requirement for a conversion narrative in certain New England churches left many people unable to enjoy full membership. This meant that they could not baptize their children. This brought about what is known as the Halfway Covenant. The Halfway Covenant was devised as a means of offering a partial church membership to people who could not pass the test of offering an acceptable conversion narrative. In 1657, a ministerial convention suggested that the members of unconverted children should be accepted for baptism and church membership if they would simply give a profession of faith called Oni, the Covenant, in place of a conversion narrative. In 1662, a synod, or synod, of the churches accepted the practice, which came to be called the Halfway Covenant. Because the Synod only had advisory power, the covenant was disapproved by many churches and never became universal. The halfway covenant was viewed by some pastors as a serious compromise to achieving a city on a hill. Keep in mind that these people traveled across the ocean at great risk to life and property for this city on a hill ideal. Many lost children and even their spouses to revert back to the practices they experienced in England was almost unthinkable. Nevertheless, a different approach to achieving a pure church was needed. That approach was evangelism. Despite objections from free grace theology proponents, preparationism was an important part of the legacy of Calvinism among the Puritans. The doctrine stood in contrast to traditional Calvinistic beliefs in that it suggested that a person, though they could never earn grace, could prepare to receive it. The first persons in American history dubbed as preparationists were colonial pastors Thomas Hooker, Thomas Shepard, and Solomon Stoddard. Preparationism was a novel evangelistic measure that sought to assist people in the sometimes confusing and difficult process of genuine conversion. Rather than leave them in a state of confusion, they came alongside and counseled them to prepare themselves to be converted. Although imperfect and widely resisted, it was a significant positive step to the method of evangelism as displayed in the book of Acts. Although they believed that God was sovereign in dispensing grace, they also believed that human beings could prepare themselves to receive that grace. Some Calvinists, zealous to uphold God's free and sovereign grace, rejected preparationism. The Synod or Synod of Dort in the Netherlands called it Pelagian. Thomas Hooker was first a nonconformist and later a prominent Puritan colonial leader and founded the colony of Connecticut after dissenting with Puritan leaders in Massachusetts. In 1633, he was made pastor of Newtown, Massachusetts. The church was comprised of men who had been his followers in England, who had crossed the ocean, established themselves at Newtown, and called him to be their preacher while he was still in exile in Holland. His concern was religious liberty. He did not find it in Massachusetts. What he did find was a theocracy and consequently an aristocracy. Here the church ruled almost like the church ruled in Rome, only it was another church and there was no pope. No man could vote unless he was a church member. No person could be a church member unless they could give a conversion narrative. Only one in ten men of mature age was qualified to vote. In 1632 in London, and again in 1638 in the Netherlands, 
one of Hooker's most significant preparationist writings was published. It was entitled, The Soul's Preparation for Christ, being a treatise of contrition, wherein is discovered how God breaks the heart and wounds the soul in the conversion of the sinner to himself. This protracted title was followed by the text in Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. He begins the work with the text. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and said to Peter and the other apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? Acts 2, verse 37. Old-time ministers thought of sinners in one of three different ways. There was the careless sinner who could care less about their soul and never thought about their need for Christ or for salvation. Then there was the awakened sinner. This is a person who's maybe gone through something catastrophic or maybe the Holy Spirit or some sermon or something like that has awakened them to their need for a savior. And then thirdly, there was the convicted sinner who was directly under the hand, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. Thomas Hooker had a unique approach in awakening sinners from their carelessness. And I'd like to talk about that just now. Thomas Hooker believed that awakening sinners required a special application of particular sins as a chief means to bring people to a sight of their sins and to a true sorrow for them. In this way, Hooker followed the pattern of both the apostles and the prophets. This was the pattern in the Bible and has been a practice of many faithful ministers since. As John the Baptist, the minister is to preach directly and not secretly when intimating truths. This means that you're speaking directly to the person. He deals roundly with rebellious sinners, as did John the Baptist, who said, O generation of vipers, who forewarned you to flee the wrath that is to come? This suggests the depth of the sin and the evil of the person and the wrath that is set in store for them. Again, he does not speak in vague generalities, but shows the rebellious their sins in particular. And when the publicans came to be baptized, he says, Receive no more than is appointed for you. And he says to the soldiers, Do violence to no man, and be content with your wages. Luke 3, verse 13 and 14. John the Baptist was called to be a minister of humiliation and preparation, and therefore he deals plainly with them. In this way, John the Baptist followed the pattern of Elijah. When Ahab had slain Naboth, the prophet came to him and said, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick thy blood. Ahab said, Hast thou found me, O my enemy? And he said, I have found thee out, because you have sold yourself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. The text goes on to say that when he heard this, he put on sackcloth and went softly. Thomas Hooker's approach to awakening careless sinners is truly a throwback to the New Testament. In fact, he is years ahead of his time in terms of employing the Word of God in a way that we read about in the book of Acts. You see, Thomas Hooker believed that when a person gives a reproof or shows a person their sins, they are not to speak in generalities. They are not to preach so as to shoot the arrows over their heads or low towards the ground, but to shoot them directly at the person so as to cause them to realize that it is them that you are referring to. He would say something like, Oh, all you drunkards and adulterers, this is your portion. 
and let this be venom in your hearts to purge away your lusts. When our Savior Christ lapped up the Pharisees all in one speech, it is said that they heard the parable and he knew that they meant them. When particular application comes home to the heart and a minister says, this is your drunkenness and your adultery and profaneness, and this will break your neck one day, what assurance have you got of God's mercy? And what can you say for heaven? Question. Then men begin to look about them. There was never any convicting ministry, nor any man that did in plainness apply the word home, but their people would be reformed by it, or else their consciences would be troubled and desperately provoked to oppose God and his ordinances, that they may be plagued by it. Unquote. You see, Thomas Hooker believed the word of God was like a sword, and the exposition of the text was like the drawing out of the sword and the flourishing of it. He found that some would wave it around as a man would wave around a gun. However, in doing so, it never hit the person's heart rightly or made any real impact. Nevertheless, when a man strikes a full blow at a man, it either wounds him or puts him against the wall. So the application of the word was like the striking with the sword. It will work one way or another. If a man can block the blow, so it is. But if not, it wounds him. Hooker then concluded, I confess it is beyond our power to awaken the heart. But ordinarily, this way does good. Among the preparationists, there were none more unique than Solomon Stoddard. This man was Jonathan Edwards' grandfather. He was unique because he believed that people shouldn't be kept from the Lord's table simply because they were sinners. Understand that he was converted by coming to the Lord's table and seeing himself as a sinner in a unique way and receiving, at least from his testimony, the Lord's grace. So he believed that if it was good enough for him, it ought to be good enough for others. So this was a novel approach to the entire concept and doctrine of the Lord's table. He believed sinners could receive the Lord's table as a means of grace whereby they may turn their hearts to the Lord. Solomon Stoddard was perhaps the foremost preparationist preacher in New England. By today's standards, Solomon Stoddard would be labeled a hellfire and brimstone type preacher. He believed that preachers were to preach the threatenings of the law, man's insufficiency, and God's sovereignty. He believed that the unconverted and needed to have the reality of their soul's condition set clearly before them in order to arrest their minds and set it squarely upon the subject of their salvation. Solomon Stoddard counseled ministers that men cannot exercise faith until the heart is prepared by a sense of danger and the insufficiency of other things. As long as they think they can help themselves, they will not come to Christ for help. Solomon Stoddard was a Calvinist, so he believed in the doctrine of election. So while he would tell people on the surface that they needed to repent, he believed that they could not repent unless God enabled them to repent. This caused many people to despair, even of life, because of the things that they would be told. They had hell set before their eyes and were left to wonder if they were one of the elect or not. The problem wasn't so much necessarily the hellfire preaching, nor the conviction of sin that the people came under, but it was that added preoccupation with unconditional election that vexed many men and women's souls. Solomon Stoddard believed that preaching God's sovereignty was a means of humbling proud sinners. The belief was that a person has to understand that they are helpless to help themselves. The whole of salvation was the work of God but man is still called to Christ. To many people, 
This was a gross contradiction. Nevertheless, during Solomon Stoddard's ministry, he would see movements of God. However, things began to go into declension towards the end of his life, setting the stage for some tremendous historical events. If, all right. Well, I wonder if you had any kind of aha experiences, as one of my professors used to ask. It's a lot to consider, isn't there? We have come a long ways in the last couple hundred years in the way the gospel has been per, uh, presented. And Thomas Hooker's approach and Solomon Stoddard's approach, of course, uh, their idea was that people needed to be awakened from their spiritual slumber, and to recognize their need for God, their need for a Savior, and uh, ultimately they needed to be brought under conviction of the Holy Spirit, and that they needed to turn to Christ and, and to stop resisting the Holy Spirit, and of course ultimately to receive the Holy Spirit. And uh, this was the method, this was the uh, idea, this was the way the gospel was preached. And um, I suggest to you that we need to return once again, even as they did in the times of the Puritans and uh, when they had came over on the Mayflower with an attempt to try to bring genuine Christianity to the new world, that we need to return to the book of Acts and get back to preaching the gospel as it was once delivered to the saints. I just want to pray tonight uh, before we go. I just want to pray. Heavenly Father, I just come before you tonight with thanksgiving in my heart, thankful for this great gospel that you have given us. Lord, I pray tonight that if there's someone that has been watching this video, or maybe they'll watch it later on Facebook or YouTube or however they may come across it, Lord, that they would be sensitive to the dealings of your spirit. Lord, that maybe something that was said to tonight or in this message has awakened them to their need for Jesus Christ and maybe they've heard the gospel many times and they're saying well I sure never heard this Lord I pray that you would deal with them Lord cause them to get into the Word of God for themselves into the New Testament and, and let the Word of God speak to their hearts so they could walk in the very footsteps if you will of the disciples as they walk with Jesus and they came to the crossroads many times to decide whether or not that they would truly want to serve the Lord Lord it is my prayer that that there wouldn't be one under the influence of this meeting tonight that when you ultimately stand in judgment of all of us, Lord, that you would say to any of them uh, or any of us, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Lord, help us to recognize that it's not as the false prophets that have gone before us have taught. Lord, there is a genuine need to repent, to receive the Holy Spirit, to re repent and receive forgiveness and grace and all of these things that we talk about, Lord, in the gospel, and that these things are not just somehow uh, extras, but these things are all vital and essential to the gospel. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And Lord willing, we're going to be back next week and we're going to uh, look at session, session six, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Solomon Stoddard, and then we're going to look at Jonathan Edwards and uh, the First Great Awakening. So God bless you, and thank you being, for being with us tonight.